Greetings, everyone. Oh, boy, busy morning for me. Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to a, a Blues in the Schools program entitled Blues 101. I don't have a lot of time, so I must use my time wisely. And, uh, and uh, I like to have a fat hour, but I'm not getting one, so I'm going to take what I can get. I've been trying to get to you guys for a long time, and I have finally arrived, and I have a lot of information to put on your plates. You learn a lot about music while you're in school. I enjoy hearing the people do originals, because if you don't do originals, you will become a mediocre copy of someone else's genius. So I always encourage people, do your own stuff. And uh, 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 this is what we call a blues in the schools program. You're going to learn about classical music, marching band music, jazz music. And today, we're going to have a slice of the blues. When you walk out of that door today, if someone should ask you what the blues is, why it's important and where it came from, I want you to be able to tell them. Now, most people haven't heard of B.B. King or Stevie Ray Vaughan or, or they heard that Kraft Macaroni and Cheese. I got the Blue Box Blues. They heard some kind of blues music. Well, I'm going to see if I can't dispel any of the myths. Blues music is one of America's great gifts to world culture. If you like rhythm and blues, if you like rock and roll, if you like hip hop, if you like house music, if you like alternative styles, somebody asked me about doo-wop, whatever type of musical style you listen to, if you trace it back to its origins, you will find the blues. Now, this is not a concert. I won't have time to give you a whole song, but I can play just enough to give you an idea of what it sounded like. This is a historical overview of the blues. So I'm going to pull out the stops, and there's a lot of stuff I'm not going to talk about because we don't have the time. But some of the fundamental things I think you should know. Okay, what is the blues? Now, I'm going to answer that. I'm going to give you a simple answer that you can remember. Um, what is the blues? Is it a pair of jeans? Is it a hockey team? Is it some old guy sitting on a stump singing about his woman left him early in the morning? It's a little bit of all that, but I'm going to give you a good, some good definitions. Someone should ask you what the blues is. You tell them that the blues is real music, which simply means it's not make-believe, and you don't sing songs about the way you want things to be. You sing songs about the way things are. And if they ask you what the blues is, you can tell them it's facts of life music. Well, what do you mean facts of life, Mr. Frugland? Whatever life is, that's what the blues is. Simple. Sometimes life is happy, and people sing songs like, hey, hey, the blues is all right. And then sometimes life can be quite serious. If you wrote a song about somebody's house flooding, that would not be a happy song. So the blues, the blues covers the full spectrum. It can be sad because life can be sad. It can be happy because life can be happy. But never let anybody tell you that it's all sad music. It's not. It's basically music of expression. It's very easy to learn but hard to master. If you woke up this morning, hopped on a school bus and came to school, if I put that to a certain type of music, that's the blues. I woke up this morning. I felt around for my shoes. Is this coming out? This morning, I felt around for my shoes. I missed the school bus. I had to walk to school. And if you leave school and go back home, and I put that to a certain type of music, that's what the blues is. It's not sophisticated, not hard to comprehend. It's very, very, very simple. What is the blues? The blues is real music. It's American roots music. When we say American roots, what are we talking about? We know roots grow at the bottom of trees. It creates a, a trunk and branches. And the same with music. American roots music is those original styles of music that we know, like the blues. And it is from the blues that all of our other musical styles, like hip hop and rhythm and blues, they, they begin to take place. Uh, blues, like all other musical styles, is created out of fusion. Fusion means to mix musical styles. And so in order for us to get a clearer picture of what this is, we're going to travel to the southern states. In your mind's eye, draw an outline of the United States. Okay, you got that? An outline of the United States in your mind's eye. 
Now go to where the southern states are, and I want you to darken them all in. Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, Missouri, Arkansas, North and South Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia, and Florida. These are the southern states. You have an outline of the U.S., you've darkened into all the southern states. Now divide them in equal thirds with a cookie cutter, because each one of these thirds represent a region in the south where the blues was born. Now, quickly, we're going to go back in time to the 1850s. No PlayStations, no radios, none of that stuff. 1850s, and we're going to head to the southern states, because that is the land where the blues was born. And now we're going to get into this thing. They used to have these big farms in the South called plantations. And on a plantation, everything you eat, you grow. And most of the things you work with, you build them right there on that plantation. It is on these plantations among black Americans where the blues began to emerge as a popular form of folk singing. Three types of musical styles make up the blues. Field hollers, work songs, and religious music each contributing in its own way to the makeup of the blues. Now there's a perfect example of what we call fusion. Well, what is a feel holler? Now this is before we called it blues, okay? I call this the DNA of blues music. They sang feel hollers. What's a feel holler? A feel holler is the oldest form of singing the blues that we know. There were no instruments. A feel holler did not have form or structure. And people would sing field holler. The field holler was almost like a newspaper on your plantation. If someone was getting married and you sang about it, and someone heard it and they repeated it, by the end of the day, the whole county would know what was going on. I want to give you an example of a field holler. Maybe you'll see an old movie. If you saw the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou?, then you're already ahead of the game. Because in that movie, they did field hollers, they did work songs, and they played a lot of the early forms of country blues. My favorite field holler is called Old Hannah. In the state of Texas, they used to have a nickname for the sun. They used to call the sun Old Hannah, especially among the seniors. And they'd come out on a real hot day and they'd go, oh my God, Old Hannah is really burning bright. Or they would sing a song like this. No instruments, simply using the throat. If they were plowing the fields or, or chopping or cutting or doing some kind of farm work, they would sing a field holler. Go down, oh Hannah, don't you rise no more. Well, if you rise in the morning, bring judgment day. You ought to be on the brassy 18 and 10 Why they were working the women like they did the men Three types of musical styles made up the blues. It was the feel holler that developed the throat in what we call vocal tonality. Three types of musical styles. The feel holler, and then there were work songs. Work songs were heard all over the South, and you've heard work songs before. I've been working on the railroad all the live long day. That's a work song. A work song is when you get caught up in the rhythm of the movement and you create a metric or a beat for your music students, okay? If guys were laying tracks for railroads, if all of us got together and we decided to unload a warehouse or unload a boat and we're passing boxes back and forth, we would sing a song. Why? Because when you work and sing, you create a rhythm of movement. If you march and sing, you can march further. Because while you're marching and singing, you're creating a rhythm of movement. Sound off, one, two, one, two, three, four. You've seen these old movies where these guys are in the belly of these old boats, and they're rowing, and there's a man in the center with a, a drum, and he's keeping a cadence. He can make them row fast, and he can make them row slow. And you rarely get tired. If you exercise and you're listening to music, you can exercise longer. Turn off the music and it's uphill all the way. There's something about that that we get involved in. The fundamental difference between a work song and a field holler, with work songs, work tools will be used to create beats. Today, rappers go into studios and with electronic beats, they hit the boards and they sing between the beats. 
long time ago, they didn't have electronics. They had sledgehammer picks and axes, and they would create beats with those, and they would sing between the beats. Two guys chopping the log with axes. One would come down and hit the log. Bam! Pull his head back. Now this guy would hit the log. Bam! Bam! And between these beats, they would sing songs like this. Mississippi River, bam, so deep, so wide, bam, the girl that I love, bam, is on the other side. And the next thing you know, you got a pile of wood that's tall, and you're not tired, because you get caught up in the rhythm of the movement. That was the power of the work song. Field hollers and work songs, and also religious music. Gospel music was not discovered at this point in time. So all of the religious music was hymnos, hymnody, the study of hymnos. It was hymnos or spirituals. And religious music served the same purpose today as it did in 1850. It makes us feel better. It gives us a hope of a better tomorrow and a belief in a greater power and a special place. When my grandmother says, you can go and have a seat and can't nobody put you out. Now, this is the oldest religious song that I know. It was written in 1779, so you do the math. Now, I'm not saying here there'd been no John Newton, that I wouldn't be sitting in his chair, but it's a good chance. Google his name, John Newton. He had a very interesting history before he uh, decided to be, uh, be uh, uh, before his religious conversion. And in the city of Olney, there's a book called the Olney Hymnals. When I was traveling to the UK, I, had, I wanted to go by and see and visit his library. But I discovered you just can't walk in there and knock on the door and go in there. You had to come by letter. So I had to get a professor at the University of Chicago to write me a letter so I can present the letter so they would let me come in here. Okay, but I still was not able to get that accomplished. Anyway, this is one of the oldest songs I know. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So here's what happened. 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, music started coming out of the South. It was field hollers, work songs, and religious music. They weren't even calling it the blues yet. It was just different little things people were singing down there, but they began to fuse together. Someone might take the beats from a work song and mix it with the melody of a religious song, or take something from a religious song and mix it with a field holler. Between these three different musical styles, this music started to emerge, and someone started referring to it as the blues. Who it was, we don't know. The first recorded use of the English word blues was back in the 1500s, and it was used to describe an anxious or a troubled state of mind. In the 1600s, the term blue devil was a common term used to describe depression, evil spirits, and despair. And in the 1800s, blacks began to apply the term to a certain type of folk music that spoke to the social realities in their lives. Just like Facebook, the blues got too big to ignore. It got so where people would travel no uh, south, maybe they can see some railroad workers uh, laying tracks for railroad and singing songs. They came for the music. Or they would be near a plantation and hear some field hollers. They'd stop and just listen to this music. Okay, but uh, somewhere before the turn of the century, someone started calling it the blues. Who it was, we don't know. Nobody wrote it down. But the music was not legitimate. It was considered alternative. When we don't know what to call music, it's alternative. We can't identify with it in anything we got so far, it's alternative. If it stays around long enough, we'll give it a name. We'll say, I kind of like this. Why don't we call it hip house? Oh, why don't we call it rock and roll? It'd be a quick name that everybody knows right off the bat what this is. Oh, we'll call it ska. They'll call it something. And so uh, uh, this music came out of there. They called it primitive plantation music. They referred to it as coon songs. It was a big joke. But it began to grow and grow in popularity. And then a man would be born who would change everything. There was a man by the name of W.C. Handy. William Christopher Handy is called the father of the blues. The father of the blues. And why is he called the father of the blues? Because he was the first person to compose and publish a blues song way back in 1912. It was a song called the Memphis Blues that was written by commission for a man to be elected into office. And the song got the man elected. 
and the man did what he said he was going to do, the very first song. But let me tell you a little bit about William Christopher Handy. He was born into a rare black family because they had some money. He was born in a middle class family. His grandfather built the first Methodist church in Florence, Alabama. His father was a minister. W.C. Handy was born November the 16th, 1873 in Florence, Alabama. Now, his, his grandfather was a minister, built the first Methodist church that's still standing today in, in, in Florence, Alabama. His daddy was a minister who used to wear the collar. And when William Christopher Handy was growing up, his father wanted him to go to college and get his degree, which he did, and become a school teacher because that was a very respectable job. One day, William Christopher Handy comes home with an acoustic guitar like this. When his daddy saw the guitar, he went off. It upset him. You know why? Because musicians around the turn of the century had a difficult time making a living. You played locally, but that was about it. They didn't have circuits. I can travel on a circuit today. I can leave Memphis, go to St. Louis, leave St. Louis, go to Chicago, leave Chicago, go to Detroit, leave Detroit and go to Canada, and they know I'm coming before I get there. It wasn't set up like that around the turn of the century. You know what his daddy told him? William Christopher Boy, I'd rather follow you to your grave than for you to become a musician. You're going to wreck your life. He thought that musicians were wanderers, idlers, rounders, malingerers, whiskey drinkers, and loafers. And he considered their musicianship a parlor accomplishment. I am so glad that William Christopher Handy prevailed. He would sneak in the bushes and learn to play his instruments. He became a fine coronet player and he played piano. And he kept this from his old man as long as he could because his father didn't like musicians. He made him take his acoustic guitar back to the store and encouraged him to buy an unabridged dictionary instead. Read W.C. Handy's autobiography and he'll tell you himself. So W.C. Handy became very, very famous after that and he began to travel in bands and groups and he just became more and more and more famous. Well, you might say, wait, Mr. Fruitland, if they were middle class and they owned land and houses, how did he get the blues? Did he pick any cotton? Nope. Did he have a hard life? Nope. N nope. Musicians with a hard life, soft hands? Nope. Well, then how did he get the blues? Here's how he got the blues. He used to take his big band down in Mississippi. It was like... Uh, 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 I guess he would rehearse the band and have a free crowd. He would take his band down to Mississippi and put on concerts for the local people in, in these small towns, like Clarksdale, Mississippi. Now I need your imagination. You got a bunch of people living in town. They didn't have an opportunity like you guys to go to school every day. So they're sitting around town kicking rocks and looking for some work to do. Then all of a sudden they would hear this music. When they looked down the road, here comes W.C. Handy and his marching band. This was a sight for so eyes. These guys were clean shaven and neat. They were marching in military formation. They had starched collars, shiny brass buttons, marching in military formation. They would stop in the center of town and they would play the popular bo uh, marching band music of the day, John Philip Sousa stuff. The locals would be just wild by this. And sometimes they would come out and say, Mr. Handy, sir, can we play something for you? They'd have old beat up guitars, jugs, washboards, bones, anything they can make noise with, and they start playing blues. They were playing a scale that tickled W.C. Handy's ear. Now we've all heard that seven note scale, that do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do scale. That's a seven note scale. Now they have a five note scale called the pentatonic scale, or the old slave scale. You take out the number two note, the number six note, and you flatten everything else, and you get. And if you play around with it. When W.C. Handy heard that for the first time, he said, hey, do that again. put that in musical notation. Those tiny dots that we musicians stare at to tell us what to play. He was the first one who liked this enough and did this. And then he sent it uh, to Washington, D.C. Uh, and had it published. He was the first one to do this. He was hired to help a man get to elected into office. If you go to Memphis, Tennessee today, there's a street called Crump Boulevard. Well, Mr. Crump, 
Mr. E.H. Crump. He was going to clean up Memphis. Memphis became a rough town to stay in around the turn of the century. They used to call it the New York of the South. It was cutting and shooting and gambling. And if you got your butt kicked, well, you must be in Memphis, Tennessee. He cleaned up the town all right. He did get elected into office, and it got so clean that if you blew your horn during daylight hours, you could get a ticket. Okay? He straightened out Memphis, and it was because W.C. Handy wrote a song called The Memphis Blues. It didn't hit the big hit for the blues, but it was a local popular song. If you couldn't play the Memphis Blues, you couldn't get a gig. They say bosses and secretaries were dancing out in the streets. Back then, when someone ran for office, you built a grandstand, you draped it with flags, you passed out flyers, you hired a big band to attract a crowd of people, and you made speeches. Today, they just beat us over the head with commercials. But that's the way they did it back then. And then, two years later, some of the things his daddy told him had come true. Now, uh, uh, the Columbian Exposition was, taking place in, was supposed to take place in Chicago in 1892. That would have been 400 years of progress since Christopher Columbus discovered America until 1892 here in Chicago. W.C. Handy goes up to Chicago with his whole band, but they had postponed it for a year. So it didn't take place until 1893. So he had to disband all his band members and send everybody home. And some of the things his dad had told him had come true. He couldn't feed himself. He was starving to death. And he wrote one more song before he left the city of St. Louis. He wrote a song called the St. Louis Blues. They named a hockey team after W.C. Handy's song. There's a statue of William Christopher Handy in St. Louis on Tucker Boulevard. There's a statue of William Christopher Handy in Memphis, Tennessee. There's a statue and a historical society that has his complete pedigree in Henderson, Kentucky. And then there are road markers. If he, so much, if he stopped in your town to buy some lifesavers, they was ready to put up a road marker for this guy. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of the St. Louis Blues. It was written for a 65-piece band orchestra. I'm by myself, so I'm going to need your imagination. I'm what they call a solo acoustic blues artist, which means I play by myself. I'm basically a one-man band. I don't have a drummer. I tap my foot. I play my own bass. I play my own rhythm. I play my own lead. So now I'm going to start off with my bass. Let me turn it up just a tad, just a tad. Now I need a horn section, because he had one. drums and cymbals. playing the St. Louis Blues, and when Italy invaded Ethiopia during World War II, the Ethiopian war anthem was the St. Louis Blues. Can you see guys going into battle 
playing this particular song. The St. Louis Blues established the blues as a true American art form. Now all the people who made fun of this music began to rethink what they were doing. And all of a sudden, the blues start going mainstream. Well, what do you mean mainstream, Mr. Fruitland? Well, that don't, that doesn't, mainstream means not everybody, but most everybody, okay? Uh, the blues went mainstream. And so people like Cole Porter and Gershwin, great songwriters, began to incorporate the blues in their music. The big bands of the day, Paul Whiteman, Earl Fuller, Rudy Valley, and you may not know these names, but I'm throwing them out there. They uh, began to incorporate the blues, and the blues was here to stay. There are basically two types of blues music. There's country blues, which I'm a big fan of, and there's what we call city or the urban sound, which most of us are used to hearing. But I like early country blues. From the 1920s, 1930s, and the 1940s, there was country blues. It was mostly played in the country, okay? It hadn't reached the big city yet. And, uh, and, and if you go get those southern states, we go get these, we had an outline of the U.S., we had all of the southern states silhouetted or darkened in, and we divided them in equal thirds. Each one of these thirds is a region. The one in the middle is the Mississippi Delta, where I'm from. That's where W.C. Handy would go and do free concerts. The Mississippi Delta was isolated from the mainstream. People who lived there never left. And when strangers came, they wanted to know, who are you looking for? You state your business and get out. They didn't want anybody coming down there in Mississippi trying to change their way of life. So they were very unfriendly to strangers. And so when you listen to the Delta style, it's kind of primitive. And primitive playing really is hard because you, it less is more when it comes to that style of playing. But let's go over to the Piedmont region. That's on the East Coast, uh, North and South Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, that area over there. Now, the music that was played there was a little bit more advanced. The, uh, we like to say it had more harmonic inventiveness in it. Okay, the musicians there weren't so isolated. They can travel up and down the East Coast. They met each other, they traded licks back and forth. So you had a more sophisticated way of, of playing. The blues band was not really born yet. Okay, so you had these individuals, they didn't have amplifiers, so you did house parties, you, you played to where people can still hear your music. Now on the East Coast, they had many medicine shows. Unlike Walgreens and CVS, somebody would pull up in a wagon and they have bottles of this stuff. Some, they, they uh, pills, they call it, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, uh. they'd have all kind of concoctions, which was basically probably alcohol, and some food coloring in there, Dr. Benson's Jackrabbit tablets, and all sorts of stuff to people to buy. Everybody would leave an intermission and try this stuff out, and when they come back, they was feeling pretty good. And they figured, if I'm feeling good, I must be well. And so the blues played in that part of the country was a little bit more sophisticated. It had what we call the alternating bass line. Drop D. That's an alternating bass line. This is the easy part. If you saw the movie, Old oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I love that mu movie. They were playing Americana. They were playing American Roots music. You heard Phil Holler's work song and Piedmont style playing. Now this is the easy part. Now what you have to do now is put a melody on top of that. What you're gonna hear is country and blues. There was a time when blues and country was together like brothers and sisters before the war. And when they did finally get radio, when you turn radio on, there was no soul stations, no rock stations, no top 40. Everybody heard the same music. You're going to hear country and blues and a touch of mountain. Take it up a little bit. Somebody's knocking on your door. Hey, hush, better hush, cause somebody's knocking on your door. You better hush, you better hush, cause somebody's knocking on your door. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do? 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 Tell me what you're gonna do when death comes creeping in the room. Tell me what gonna do when death comes creeping in the room. 
death come creeping in the room. Yes, it was. Some people say that the alternating bass line played by the thumb represents the unyielding presence of the system or the establishment. And while the melody played by the fingers represent the release of inhibition and an affirmation of a blues man's individuality. Hello. God told Nicodemus that he must be born again. God told Nicodemus that he must be born again. God told Nicodemus that he must be born again. Oh my Lord, oh my Lord, what shall I do? 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 Country blues, country blues, 1920s, 1930s, depending on where you are in the South, because it sounded different in different places, there was country blues. Then here comes the d Depression, and things changed. Everything changed. Everything changed. Uh, my grandmother told me that mechanicals came, and she, when she said mechanicals, she was talking about farm equipment, Caterpillar, International Harvester, John Deere. She said mechanicals came and took everybody's job. So now they got these, uh, this farm equipment that's, uh, that's showing up all over the southern states. And what do you think happened to the sharecroppers? They lost their jobs. The, uh, they were trying to con regulate and control the price of cotton. Everybody was selling cotton. It wasn't worth nothing. So the government was paying many farmers not to even grow any cotton and paying them to kill off their little piglets, okay, because they got to eat. And, uh, and then they just paid them this money. The hope was, they should have wrote it down, but the hope was they would share th this money with the sharecroppers. Instead, they invested in more farm equipment. So naturally, what are these people going to do? They were such a pitiful, poor-looking lot, and they were too afraid to demonstrate, so they would just walk along the highways, and people, passersby, would see them, and it was an embarrassment to the state that their citizens have to look like this and have to live like this. And so all of a sudden, people would show up in the southern states saying they got jobs up north. Now, many of the people that lived in the south were not sophisticated. They didn't know nothing about unions. They didn't know nothing about being no scab. All they knew that $2 an hour beat $2 a week. And so people start heading north looking for a better way of life, and they found it. For the first time, they can buy shoes, more than one pair. Somebody would go north, do well, and come back to the south, and people would look at them and say, hey, where you get that car from? I got it up in Chicago. They made it seem like if you could just get to the big city, it was dollar bills floating up and down the streets. And people left the south in droves. They walked. They traveled. They, some of them came up in caskets. They traveled on tractors, they, on trains, cars, any way they could. They headed north looking for a better way of life, and they found it. And that's when the music started to change with the Great Migration. Migration means... Ah! Ah! Okay, um, let me quickly, all right. So they went north and the music started to change. Okay, it lost its country edges. It lost its country edges. All that country stuff and it developed a groove. The blues band was born. And now instead of one guy playing his bass line, playing his rhythm, playing his lead and stomping his foot, he got a drummer. He doesn't have to stomp anymore. He got a bass man. And now a groove jumps into the music. It loses its country edges and it develops a groove that's still there today. They say, I don't know how you define a groove. I just know they jump in our bodies and they'll make us start bouncing around with you no matter what we're doing. So now you have a bass man. You have a rhythm player. He, he no longer has to wear the harmonica around his neck. This is what we call a Bob Dylan torture device or rack. He can have a harmonica player. And the only thing he needs now, the only thing that's missing in this, in this mix is a lead guitar player. How can you tell? 
How can you tell a lead guitar player when you see one? That's the guy on stage just making all the faces. <laughs> comes our musical styles. If you take blues and mix it with jazz, you get rhythm and blues. If you take blues and mix it with hymnals or spirituals, you get a gospel sound. If you take blues and simply crank up the tempo, you get rock and roll. Take a blues shuffle. Slow shuffle. You can't cut a rug off of this. I'm going up. But if you crank up the tempo and call it rock and roll, you sure can. Early in the morning and out of school, the teacher was teaching the golden rule. American history and practical math. You study it hard and you're hoping to pass. I'm working my fingers right down to the bone. The guy behind me won't leave me alone. Ring, ring goes the bell. Which is nothing but the blues cranked up very fast. All of our musical styles, I can show you examples of how they come from the blues. I wish we had more time. The blues is not an angry music. You cannot listen to the blues and keep your fist balled up. They don't have mosh pits at blues festivals, okay? It's very, very peaceful music. We call it the poor man psychologist because it allows you to express yourself. And there's a healing in that. If you can sit down and express yourself, it can help you sort things out. Ah! Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>